So this is a recording for the Cookpad Project. Um, my name is Matthew O'Brien. Today is the 18th of July, 2023, and I have here with me Niall Deacon. Thank you very much, Niall. Um, can you just confirm uh, for the recorder that you're happy to take uh, part in the project? This is something I've been looking forward to since I heard about the project, so yes, I have. Fantastic, thank you very much. And just for the record, could you spell your name for the recorder? My name is spelled N-I-A-L-L. -L. And my surname is D E A C O N. Perfect. Thank you very much, Val. Um, so we might start with the your early life, uh, if that's all right. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your early life? Maybe where you were born, and um, where did you grow up, and what are some of your earliest memories? The um, the house that we're um, in uh, on this recording is um, is where I was brought up as a, a child. I have moved away from it for the last ten years or so, but. Um, yeah, it contains many memories. The farmyard is in view, um, where I earn my living when it was left to me. Um, I have, even though I have moved, I'm my postal address is the same. I uh, I have loads and loads of memories, and uh, memories of people, and memories of the area. And um, yeah, it's. Uh, that's who I am, where I am, where I came from. Brilliant. Um, and even some of your earliest memories in this house then, what, what might they be? Oh gosh, there's a childhood memory of um, of a figure drawn of a, a rabbit in blue clothing on uh, on the end of a cot. And I, um, I, I have done all sorts of things to try and find and anyone else who has memories of that. So I don't know whether that was my colourful imagination or the very earliest childhood. No, I was one of four here. Um, the traditional family farm, um, all hands to the pump. Um, there were chores, there were um, loads, loads of self-sufficiency in um, hens in the yard um, for both laying eggs and for sitting up on the table. and all the animals that went with it, the sheep, the cattle, the, the pigs were a, a huge part of, um, of our, of our life that pigs were known as they could tidy up slops. They could, um, potatoes, there would have been two acres of potatoes and the, um, you know, trying to, you would not finish pigs on potatoes on their own, but, um, if you had a dry sow, she was happy enough to chomp away on a few potatoes, but um, so the the whole thing was um, everything slotted in, you know, the growing of vegetables, the growing of the potatoes. The, the um, I remember stacking butter in Larkin's shop in Anascarty, and it would have been homemade butter that my mother would have made just behind that wall in the dairy, which was on the north side of the house no refrigeration just kept out of the sun the um you daren't touch the marble uh, slab that the butter was kept cold on because of contamination in them and your hand could actually warm up the flipping slab butter um in summertime in hot summertime trying to get it to stay in that shape or trying to <laughs> it was it was uh, an immense task um they quite often made at the crack of dawn i mean three o'clock and and walking to a well that might have cooler water in it because it was a deeper well <laughs> the, the amount of time that was spent on trying to make the minuscule differences and the amount of thought process that um, would have gone into yeah, we're doing that now because that will make but when I look back on it now a minuscule we plug in a, a fridge and suddenly everything changes but um, you know people talk about you know the good old days and the happy days it was um, labour intensive there was um, drudgery you know, in, in in some of the tasks, but there was also a simplicity in in thinking that um, you did your day's work, 
and you know you were exhausted quite often and there was a contentment and there was um <clears throat> the hours weren't quite as long as they are today because you just physically couldn't do it and um ah it was it was a much simpler way of life and everybody in the area was in the same place so everyone was sort of you weren't looking at so and so with his 160 horsepower tractor and his 150,000 euro mowers on it and he was oh, the whole thing um, was much easier on the mental aspect of it as everyone was at the same level but um, yeah there was also um, that contentment in menial task you know that um, and there was also an emphasis on being close to God. You know, there was an emphasis on, um, you know, people didn't live as long. <laughs> like the, the, they used to talk about the great age. Somebody made made eighty <laughs> the great age, but it's um, uh, I I don't know. There's some of the characters um, that would have been the generation even before my parents. That I, um, I I value my memories of those people and the time that I got to spend with them. You know they, um, yeah. We um, I was showing you, <coughs> excuse me. I was showing you a principle of um, of stone carving earlier, and um, you know my memory of of John Fitzhenry at the dinner table. Um, there was a stone had been hit with a plow. And the stone had been dug around and it was too big to manhandle up out of the hole. And John said um, that he'd moved the stone and John used to snuffle and, and um, I think it was from smoking a pipe, but he, yeah, I moved the stone, uh, I moved the stone and um, people sort of laughed at him. But um, John got up on, on his bicycle and rode the mile and a half home and he came back with a, a jute sack um, tied on the carrier with a fistful of, of metal tools and um, you know, he, he put a line of holes across the stone only about three inches deep and he put his plugs and feathers into the stone and the stone cleaved and um, it created a huge impression on me you know that something that was in immovable they were like not there were no hydraulics at the time like there was just what you could do with a pole and and um, we'd just come out with the horse age so there was a small tractor and but this thing was immovable but when it was split in half suddenly there you go but um if i had been a generation before i would have been here for the time when um that stone wouldn't have been um an obstacle that that stone would be a resource in that you could split that stone up into uh, gate posts if you had seven feet and um, you could make um, corner coins you, you, all the buildings that the building that we're in here at the moment is a rubble building um, in order to you didn't ring road stone at the time you, you just had to have the resource of the stone to make the coins. So um, it would take years to put the material together to build a house. And um, like when you when you go out to the farmyard, you, you will see that the number of years that there are between some of the buildings. You know, there's um, there's a name or number year numbers on on some of the buildings out there, but you'll see that that they weren't sort of one year after the other because. Um, okay, if you had money, you could hire people to come in to and put the resources together. But quite often, you you were doing some of the labour or yourself during a slack period. Not that there were many slack periods, but um, the um, the resource came from the from the locality. You know, like you weren't you weren't bringing roadstone and load of blocks, or you weren't bringing somebody else to. To bring this in it was basically what was sustainable there's some word 
sustainable. <laughs> wow, <laughs> like that in seven hundred years, this is still sustainable. You know, and the mark on the landscape was also so small. Yeah, like, um, but however, the um, my stone carving has been um, an immense gift. Um, I feel really privileged to have been brought down the, the road of art where um, I can explore my thought process, what influences me, what, um, you know, wh from my background rather than trying to impress somebody else. Um, when I started, I had a young fella um, got to college in, in England and the few bob we had would not um, support her because the exchange rate was gobbling us up. But they, um, yeah, it was either borrow it then or earn it. So I started, um, thank you John Fitzhenry for showing me a way to have an alternative income. I started creating stone blocks for um, building projects. There was, we were in that excitement of so-called boom or corruption or call it whatever you like. Um, and there were people building stone entrances and it was like they'd throw money up in the air and, and the wall would appear. It didn't matter how much. But, um, and I met a guy called Dick Joint and Dick, um, explain the principles of trying to get to the shape that you want in stone as quick as possible. Um, he taught me loads and loads uh, of, of fundamentals of, um, of carbon. So here you have a fellow who um, was, uh, you know, mixed farming um, with his family. Like all the kids had chores. My wife would have milked cows as often as I would. <clears throat> all hands to the pump as I said before you know shoulder to the shoulder to the wheel it was a great saying of my mother's you know like um gosh you know if everyone lends a hand you know like if everyone lends a hand but um and you know I, I really enjoy um having watched my children come up in um that there was no task and there still is no task that they won't take on you know, from preparing a, a chicken for the table, from, um, you know, slaughtering a sheep, from, like, the, the, there is no task that that they back away from or, or, um, or can't do. Um, and that um, is a great joy to have. But, um, but Dick taught me, um, you know, my stone carving, like when I was coming up with shapes, um, you know, you don't have to impress anyone else with, with what you're doing. If you're inspired to do something and you do it and, and it, um, it resonates with you and it sits with your spirit, um, that's all you have to do. It's not about, um, about stacking, getting the stack to go higher and higher and higher. And I have, um, I have arrived, I, um, I was in the RHA gallery this year. It's not about it's. Um, it's really simple, and he he taught me. You know, um, a lot of stone carving at the moment is being done by um, by polishing the stone to a very very fine finish. And he taught me that that distracts the eye to the finish rather than it, it, it distracts it away from the form. And as a sculptor, the primary purpose you have is form. And I, I dearly love to, um, to carve in coarse finishes with a punch. And, um, you know, there's sometimes I, I guess it gets really, really coarse, but uh, I'm very comfortable with it, but I have to slow up an odd time and, um, Get a few dollaros in just to keep me tools going. Makes sense. Um, just the, the experience that you had um, when the stone was cut with the um, with John. Yes. Yeah. Was that what? Age, what age were you when that happened? 
I'd say I was six. Okay, and do you think that was a catalyst then for you to... Oh, the, the, there are things that happen. We're back to my rabbit in the blue clothes. There, there, I have a grandson now, and you just see this sponge, and it's soaking up everything. It's... Um, you're, and, they're, and I'm not saying that they're impressionable. They are. But... The, um, there's so much to be learned in the first seven years and God forbid that he should get a screen that um, that he's happy with an image of somebody else's experience to, rather than experience it himself as children and I've done it with, with my own children and with um, nieces and nephews walking behind um, a herd of cows when they're going to milk um, when an old cow is in peak milk she has to do a waddle because the other is, is um, will be chafing her legs and you don't rush them so it's a little bit slower than the narrow gait and you, you have to slow yourself down and um, summer's evening you know and the horse flies hopping off you and you and you have to calm yourself down and go at their pace rather than go on, go on, hurry up. You, you, you just mustn't do that. So um, we did it as kids. Um, if a cow stands and does a pat, which would be a nice um, 12 inch pizza size, but about three times the thickness. And um, the real joy is to take off your footwear and put your foot in it. And their body temperature is about three degrees over ours. And to tell the children, and it was exactly what um, what I was told, it'll feel like velvet. And just close your eyes, close your eyes, and um, to, and I'd put your foot down in it. And the screams and the <laughs> and and everything else that goes with it. And um, like if you had eyes closed, uh, you could do all, get up to all sorts of mischief. But, but oh, the the simplicity, the simplicity of discovering. Do, do you know that? And everyone look look at a cow pat and they go, "Oh, it's disgusting!" It's this, that, and that. Well, that's one. That is one form. But um, remember, if you were out in desert area, um, you would be as a child. You would be going around gathering these things up when they dried as a fuel source. And be damned glad to happen on one too. Um, so it's all about experience, and, and um, yeah, I give thanks um, for my time with John and and several other neighbours and um, and that who were were basically hands on. Um, you know, lived their lived their life um, as I have said before in menial task, but the. Um, to get back to stone carving, I um, when I walk the area, um, I I could walk it to it's a bit damp today, but I could walk it to um, to stones where the lads had done maybe the most of a day digging around the stone, and they would have put in the line of of um, holes to cleave the stone, and it didn't cleave. You know, like it just um, uh, there could be a vein going the wrong way, or there could be something, but it didn't. And um, like I'm aware that, that that that's what they left behind. I can happen on gate posts or lentils in old buildings, and I can see the the wedge marks. Or um, to go up onto the local hill, um, and to see work that they have left behind. And the amazing thing that when I'm looking for a bit of stone, if I don't see those wedge marks, I'll shy away from that area because those lads had generation upon generation upon generation of experience that the stone in that area is, um, some people would say soft, but an old stony said to me one time, if somebody tells you the stone is soft, tell them to bait their head off it and see how soft it is. But um, the word we would use in the trade would be kind. Um, if you spend a day working on a stone and it's just, spitting back in your face from the punch um the next day is not going to be any different 
Whereas if you spend the day working on a stone and it is moving on, now I won't say easily, but um, you know, th that you can see the progress that you're making. Well, and another amazing task or um, discovery that I've made quite often, if you cross a stream, for some strange reason, there's, um, if you cross a stream, you could be into totally different stone. Okay. It is pure madness because in uh, the geologists would tell you that the stone that I'm using as boulder it has been glaciated. So it could have come from the North Sea. It could have, could have come in the, from anywhere. But um, like I, I, I can bring it to an area um, up Knock Row, closer to Schlegar and they, um, I, like I told you you cross a stream and you will see how the lads were working stone and walked away from it now you didn't put the effort that they would have put into carbon stone um, and leave something that was a good opportunity <coughs> excuse me behind you you didn't do that they um up um, closer to the hill where not in, not in my town's land but up closer to the hill they would have um, carved granite coins up there all winter long um, and they would have brought them to the train station in Escorti and they would have had their stack now remember a horse's car only carries a ton and a cubic meter of stone as 2.2 tons so you weren't bringing a huge amount of stone in the car farming and an engineer then would come to the station and he would select if he was doing a building somewhere and he would select that these can yeah they can and they can and it wasn't um, you were paid on delivery you were paid on this fellow's pleasure and if they weren't selected they stayed there it was um, when you think about it um, you know, soul destroying to, and, and quite often they would have gone out onto the hill and in bad weather they would have cut bushes to make a screen around the stone to try and keep the worst of the wind or the, the weather off them while they worked. It, um, there were greater men than I am and um, I acknowledge what they did. It's really, it's really, really interesting. Um, and we might come back to, to stone work a little bit later on in the, the interview as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I'm really interested in terms of the community uh, around here in, in Canaan. Um, when you were growing up, what was that like? What was the community in, in, in general like? Well, most of community was based on parish, you know, and, and um, I, I was raised a member of the Church of Ireland um, congregation. I'm still a member of the Church of Ireland congregation. I um, I dearly love to meet people um, and worship together. Uh, it matters a lot to me, but the we wouldn't have had a huge um, connection with the other or with the rest of, of community, which I. Um, I'm trying to rectify at the moment. It's um, uh, I I don't make any apology for being a member of the congregation, but uh, to live in a wider community, I wasn't. Uh, now my mother would have been hugely involved in ICA, um, but I would have met people outside in sport and. Um, and socialising, but as, as grown up, it definitely wasn't. It was, it was sort of, um, I'm not, look, I'm looking for the right word. We were, or we were a bit cut off, uh, just a little bit cut off. But that, um, that need not stay um, the way it is. But unfortunately, um, what I see now is that people don't have the interest in community and in socializing or in um, definitely conversation has taken an awful beat but um, yeah the local development group um, now I'm really involved in that and enjoying myself and um, it's, it's a lovely time to 
to be a member of the community in that um, th there's less fear about what you can say and what what you should say and, and um, you know like I don't know there was certain amounts of shame that were don't talk about that don't talk about the other and um, I'm glad to see that that has disappeared but um, yeah no the the coming to my father would never have said that anyone worked for us he would have said that people worked with us he would have said that um, that we had Jerry in today because we were at the beach or um, you know the so and so came in to because we're at the potatoes and and or and you know, it was always and um, you know the influence of those people you know and and the humor oh god the humor was was unbelievable it was um, yeah and it was never more or less at the expense of somebody else it was just like people were willing to laugh at themselves as much as. You know, like if, if something went wrong, there was, oh, it's, um, it's, it's, it would be before my time. There was, um, there was a bad time picking potatoes and the, the weather came bad and um, there was sort of a gap came of two or three days and there was a big push on to, to get these potatoes picked and, um, they were running out of sacks, so they said they'd pick into the horse's car, just throw them straight into the horse's car. And the, the horse was obedient enough to move up, and everything was going grand, but it was a trap car. As in, you could move a, a slide and the, the car would heal up. And um, nobody copped that the, the little clip for keeping the, the fastener um, in place had come loose. And somebody told the horse to move up this time. He did move up, but <laughs> all the potatoes went back out on the ground. And they didn't talk about that in dread. Like they, they just, they just started. To, they laughed at it. You know, it was, um, yeah. There, there's loads and loads of stuff like that. And, and do you think that kind of good feeling, community good feeling, and spirit, and willingness to laugh? in maybe the center of the case of like misery or tragedy yeah. do you think that's been maintained in this area um, in my age group um i i see some of it but unfortunately um in in younger now here i am being a, a proper old man saying that the um the next generation um oh god help us will there be at and i um yeah, my first instance of, of seeing an older generation uh, look down their nose at, at the younger generation was two lasses who um, were well into their 40s uh, who used to go to dances where um, us younger lads were going and they sat just inside the door and if a young girl uh, or a young fella, you know, was, it was, you know, throwing his heels up or the lass was a little bit leggy or whatever, um, the heads would go, oh, oh, what's it coming to? Oh, what's it coming to? And um, I have caught myself several times. Oh, 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 here they are, look, they're stuck on the screens. Oh, um, yeah, I, I have to, I have to um, acknowledge that there will be a future and that it's not up to me what it'll look like. But oh, if I, um, I urge people, and it happened in the Tour de France um, there of late in the last day or so, that some guy caused a major pile up by trying to get a selfie. And I just, and I've said to loads and loads of people, could you not have the memory in your head? Could you not be happy just to have, have the experience? Or are you going to try and record all this? Who's going to process it? Who's going to look for this image that you have in two or three years time? You know, it's, um, but nobody, nobody recorded what happened with John Fitzhenry and myself that day. 
but it's ingrained you know and I don't carry it like a battle scar you know that I that I've picked up um, I, my, my stone has um, has brought me to a number of operations to a couple of broken bones crushed ankle um, the removal of a fragment from a, a chisel under general anaesthetic from the <laughs> From my arm, <laughs> um, you know, the, there was an operation on a torn retina. There's, there is a, but but John's experience isn't like it doesn't wear like, like one of those scars, you know. Um, do I, if if you want me, maybe no. You were trying to get me away from stone, poor you. But um, oh, no, please feel free. I um. You talk about the community. I, I, um, my school, as in Kalan, if I have my way, it will become a proper community centre, not just the, the old school of the Church of Ireland. And it will become a, a community centre for the all the community. Um, the that's where I started my formal education, but I've been learning ever since. And I was brought in there just because I had a, a JCB type digger to dig a, a trench for an ESB line. And I pulled up a, a stone, I, I say it would have been three feet by three feet and only about six or seven inches deep. And um, I threw it to one side and I said, I must carve something out of that. I must carve something out of that. So I did put a shape into it and I mounted it on a another plinth that I had and um, it's in one of the fields and it had no title there was, there was nothing it was just a nice sort of a a C that was stretched type shape and my children said to me you know that um, it looks like a seal a performance seal you know up to catch a ball or to catch a fish or whatever so um, after it became the, the name stuck became known as the seal but it, it came to me one day you know that um our whole education system is based on approval you are given 10 spellings to learn you go home you learn those spellings and you come in the next morning you're asked to write out these spellings and you get them right and you will get a star a seal of approval that's what we need. We need somebody else's approval. But it took me the bones of 60 years to get to the place where I don't need your approval anymore. <laughs> I am, um, you know, when I'm not interfering with what anyone else is doing, and I am in a good place. I don't need anybody's approval. Now, I, I, I don't want to court controversy. I don't want to go off on a tangent or I'm not looking to have disciples come along behind me. But, um, you know, the, if I can get into that headspace, I can have a much easier life. And that's, um, we're going way, way back, way, way, way back to almost preschool. And there's John Fitzhenry. You know, and, um, and he used to bring me keys. I had a fascination with keys and he used to gather up keys, bunches of keys. And his, he lived with his sister. And when John was going out in the evening, we used to give... John kisses for now. Um, this guy wasn't a member of my family, you know. Um, I have loads of memories of family that I can talk about, but that's not where we're here for. But he, um, oh, I urge you to to experience stuff. I just urge you to experience stuff. On the topic of family. Um did your family ever have any kind of traditions 
like yearly traditions, um, traditions around the farm that they kind of maintained? At the, no, the, uh, most of the festivals would have been church festivals who, um, and the excitement uh, around Harvest Thanksgiving, the excitement about around carol service and about re, um, there would have been huge emphasis put on that. Um, yeah, and family was family was hugely important, like visiting aunts and uncles and um, you know, best bib and tucker and for God's sake don't say too much, you know, which didn't suit me at all at all. But um Yeah, um no the the traditions as in Maybush and, and stuff I do remember a Maybush and I remember um singing some of it, but it wouldn't have been um I wouldn't have been huge. The basically, when I I spoke to you about um, all hands to the pump, um, my mother lived um, into her eighties, and um, you know it never stopped. The um, the needlework, the, the there was something. The, trying to get my mother to read a novel just for the. The sheer relaxation and get your head out of your space and engage in what the author was spewing out of them. But um, I took her, but I had nothing when I was finished. I spent hours at it and I had nothing when I was finished. The um, now I'm not afflicted in the same way as as, as mum was, you know, but then I got to remember that I. I'm another generation away from famine and um, you know maybe you heard me say that I was involved with the natural burial ground down in Woodbrook um, yesterday I met a guy from Cavan and he has his mind made up to be buried in the natural burial ground which I am caretaker of yeah, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, well, well yeah. can I finish my story about him, or are you going to interrupt me all no, the time? No, not at all. But he, um, I was telling him the history of the place, that um, there's a Chestnut Avenue, which was the original entrance into um, Woodbrook Estate, call it. I don't know whether there was ever an estate. I think they're supposed to have walls around them, are they? But whatever. It was a, a big house and employed loads of people. And... Um, most of the farms around here would have been tenants of them for years and years. But during the famine period, um, this entrance was discarded. And another one was, excuse me, another one was put together on the, the penny a days. Um, and like there's, there's loads of, there's a few road cuttings around that are famine related. There's Blacker's Bridge was famine. Um, but see, there was huge shame around famine. Huge, huge shame around famine. But anyway, I'll get back to the young man from Cavan. He was humming and hawing about, I will, I won't, I will, I won't. And um, when I mentioned uh, that the, the entrance, the, the chestnut, now they're mighty old men, these chestnut trees, but. Um, and the guy who sowed them knew his stuff because he sowed them 20 metres apart and the canopies barely meet. And when you're walking up, you go from shade into light from shade. Up go the hairs and the But he, um, that swayed him that he was, um, and I'm not on commission when I uh, meet people down there, but he, that, that was so... Um, this place was involved in famine relief. I want to be, yeah, I, I'm very happy to be here. But the shame um, uh, from the field names around here, um, and I, I heard stories of, you know, the, the dreadful shame of famine. And people call it genocide, people call it whatever you like, but the, um, you know, to see somebody not beside you not doing very well, and you weren't doing that great either, and you could do what you could for them, but you, you, and the things weren't going well. And knowing that if their tenancy came up, 
Bang, your young fellow was getting up now and sure maybe he'd take that over. And the shame of of having benefited you know, because somebody else didn't do well. That, and it's never talked about. There's a famine wall on the farm where I am, um, where I live and work. It's on the way down to where my house is at the moment. And um, you can look on that in shame or you can look at it, okay, um, the people who pick the stones out, it'd be very marginal, boggy ground down there. And um, they were given um, the penny a day, which bought a scoop of maize porridge from a bag. And the bigger the family, the deeper the scoop went. And it went twice on a Saturday because you didn't work Sunday. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the politic, who was right or who was wrong, but like the shame of, of having survived the famine. You know, the same happened in the Holocaust in, in, um, in Europe, you know, that other like thousands, millions of people died and we didn't. And that, that, that shame carried on. So um, to, point your, to, to point your finger at a generation, say, oh, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. Um, but their parents would have come from do you know, I survived, I survived, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and to point your finger at someone saying, oh, you didn't get that right, you didn't get that wrong, it's not very fair. And could you tell me a little bit more about the natural burial ground? Oh, um, nine. Um, I was approached by, I would have worked um, with Giles Fitzherbert. <laughs> Uh, on different projects but um, Giles Fitzherbert wanted to be who owns Woodbrook now at the moment and um, Giles wanted to be buried on his own land found out that you cannot be unless it's designated by the county council for the burial of human remains um, a lot of people are hung up on consecrated ground but uh, as far as the um, the authorities go um there's legalities on the disposal of human remains. So um, that disappointed Giles, um, but in Fanet Head, couldn't be much further away, is a third generation undertaker um, called Colin McAteer. And he had a young girl um, send for him. She was coming to the end of her life with cancer in her teens. And she told him that she didn't want to be caught dead in one of his stuffy coffins. She wanted a white cardboard coffin that her friends could customise, that his stuffy coffins weren't her style at all. So what do you say to a person like that? Yes, I can, yes. And then he couldn't because there was no um, alternative coffins available in the country at the time. So, um, and I don't mind hanging Colin out and telling him that he took the handles off of one of his stuffy coffins and he painted it white and he stood up all night with a hairdryer trying to get the paint to dry before it came off on people's clothes and it was customised as, as the girl wished so they had a mutual friend and Colin started the alternative coffin company and there's a sister company which is the Green Graveyard and it's the only green burial ground in um, in Ireland at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are plans to open others, but um, green burial is what it sounds like. It is as easy on the planet. Um, David Bellamy had a statement of how small is your footprint? You know, like um, when you die, are you going to... Um, bring stone from all over the world just because you can afford to and hard landscape your grave and insist on your community that it's kept like that forever and ever and ever <laughs> ever and ever and ever and ever and there aren't no forever in in this world but anyway um maybe in the next the um green is corpse buried at four feet which allows it to decompose much quicker 
there's trees sold um, on graves um, not mighty oaks scrubby woodlandy type things um, my favourite hawthorn hazel that you know that nobody has sold a flipping elder yet I, I would love to have elder flower off of somebody's grave I think imagine the taste but um, yeah so some people have said it's a bit leafy for me you know when they look in on a grave from the grave marker is only a4 size 12 by 8 inches um, just um, quite often the stone comes from the digging of the grave to keep the footprint as small as possible now they asked me to be caretaker down there and oh <laughs> I'm going to earn a few bob which is you know you do a service and you um, and you you get paid but um, yeah I've, I've been completely taken with um, you know this whole thing about you know um, you know that things can evolve not stick in the one hard forever and ever and ever you know like I, I would love that um, that my grave could contribute to uh, biodiversity and to um, rather than um, the mighty strimmers and lawnmowers and whatever else now um, the briars give us a, a real good test down there <laughs> but um, as the canopy as the tree canopy gets up um, they shade them out just a little bit but um, it has been a learning process down there and um, my training as a grave digger would be that I mute it doesn't suit me at all, at all, at all, at all. I can't, I can't stop yapping. And um, the day of burial down there, um, we don't cover the clay. And the grave will be left in its natural state. And the clay will be visible there for everyone. And um, when the committal, whatever form it is, um, or whoever says prayers or non-prayers or when, uh, when that ends and when the time comes to lower the coffin and the coffin has been lowered we hand the shovel to the nearest and dearest and we suggest to them that, um, that they start the backfilling of the grave even if it's only in a token or they can as quite often happens they can um, stay with us and almost always people stay until the grave has been completely backfilled and um, on a number of occasions it has been very very therapeutic for people to you know, the, the, um, at the moment we're being sanitised away from it the, um, in, in America they have um, a flat surface that there isn't even clay to be seen and they have electric motors that somebody will We'll press a button and the um, the coffin will lower into the grave and a mat will roll out magically and it's lovely and sanitised. Um, people say, oh, do I have to hear stones hitting the coffin? Um, but I, I can give you two examples. One was... Um, a lass from Germany and there were only five there were five people at that burial she was the only family member the rest of us were um, the undertakers and the two lads on the grave and she sobbed as she backfilled the grave and I um, on a number of occasions I suggested to her you know maybe you've done your shift you know and I like that I put out my hand for the shovel and I heard no as only a woman can say and she finished it but she sobbed her heart out and um, two years later she stood in front of me and um, she said do you know I got more closure from backfilling the clay on my father's grave than I did from anything else and her statement was, I did everything I could for that man, even to backfill in his grave. And she, she says she feels sorry for people 
um, who are removed from this and, and she quite often stays if she's at a burial she stays and tells them to get away with that plastic stuff I want to do a bit of shovel you know like it's just but the other instance that that will never be forgotten was a Roman Catholic priest in his 80s was buried was there for the committal of his sister who had been a nun and once again coffin lord decade of rosary and he being nearest and dearest I handed him the shovel and he said what's this for and I said uh, as the nearest and dearest um, our tradition down here is that you start the backfill so um, he did and he stayed there and people talked and people gave a hand and and when it was over he caught my arm and he accused me as if it was my fault he said you have kept this from me all these years I've been at thousands of burials and you have kept this from me you know um, we've got to be awful careful we've got to be awful careful because regardless of where our society goes there are fundamentals there are fundamentals these cells are alive and thank God healthy but there will be a day there will be a day you know when I have to give this up and my nearest and dearest are going if they're around they're going to be involved in the disposal of this thing and um it, it cannot be sanitised it cannot be it's got to be left now um, here I am the old man saying that the old ways are the best but um, in the west of Ireland the tradition was the neighbours made the grave you know under insurance and everything else now that no you can't anymore or oh, who somebody could claim somebody could be on it somebody might have a heart attack and somebody the claim might fall is somebody this and somebody that um that has all been removed from us you know oh, be careful but the tradition in the west was that the rosary would start from the minute the coffin hit the ground and didn't stop so there would be clay flying in all sorts of directions to get this done as quick as possible. Um, yeah. It, it's really interesting. And it's very interesting. Sent sentiment, loud git. Um, I'm just interested in terms of um, these upland areas. Um, what do you think is the most important aspect of local natural heritage, say, in the Black Series? Uh, um, I spoke to you about menial tasks um, if people can't walk out onto that hill and um, don't enjoy the space there's um, there's all sorts of stuff up there there's shoot lodges there's lazy beds there's all sorts of stuff up there but um, and there's the creature forestry so we won't talk about but um like if people can't get up there and just feel you know just feel and I don't mean feel the horse flies eating off yeah I, I just mean to oh uh, have you heard a chord of music be it um, the hymn to the fallen be it river dance God saves I can't I can't listen to Anna's um, song and river dance without weeping or without the hair standing up um, if we can't if we can't teach our children the beauty of silence the beauty of expanse the wide open the be like if if um, you know, you walk up there and if the the one thing you that all you want to think about is well that's where the old coach road used to go that's Cahir's den and, and all the but if you can't teach um, sit and watch if you, if you can't um, you know enjoy the frockings 
and the heather you know and be able to ignore the sheep shit but um if you can there was cow's milk here for a good number of years um the neighbours would point the finger at me and say, Oh, you sold the herd of cows that was there for generations. But however, I did. I'm holding up my hand, I did. But, um, you know, the, it, Sunday milking was always a, a, a nasty one. Cause, uh, but we, we went, brought the children up there when they were school going age. And, um, you know, you walk to the best of your ability and, um, I would have walked on with the better able ones and the others would have stayed back with um, their mum and my wife, my darling wife, um, my life partner, my God, she's more than half of me. But, um, you know, the, we built a house together. I did a lot of the stone carving on it and um, I was lucky enough to over the, the front door the lentil, I think it's um, it's about ten foot long, which is travesty and <laughs> it's a complete abomination in stone carving because stone, the property of stone is that won't flex, so anything over five feet would have been archway. But this this thing is not carrying weight anyway. But I got to put two heads on this. Um, Everyone was talking about when Niall Deacon's building a house. Niall Deacon is all oh, the great stone carver. Niall Deacon is, and, um, you know. And I got to put two heads on this. You know, very not well carved out, or just the shape of two heads. In that, um, you know, the sum of the combined is greater than the individual parts. Without my wife's belief in me. Um, like I often spoke projects to her and she would have been doing something. She'd say, yes, yes, dear, yes. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yes, dear. <laughs> Without even thinking about it, she would support me, but I'd get to get on with the bread now or something. And, and it was, you know, um, it was amazing. Yeah, and it's amazing. I'm after forgetting where I was going about, uh, I'm really totally lost now. You had two stone heads above the door. Yeah, yeah but that, that was that the sum of the combined is greater than the individual parts. Sure. So, um, yeah, Anne would have had the smaller ones on the hill and I would have got to the top and eventually everyone got to the top. Now, we reared four kids and we had two who would trek uh, one uh, my daughter lives in Step Aside um, and she would trek on a daily basis up through the lead mines and up through and she that um, that appreciation of open space which gives your head space which gives uh, and I have a son who, who is equally as happy to trek for hours and hours and hours in your own company or if somebody's with you well and good so long as they shut up um, but it is about so the one thing that we have an asset up there and I've tried to I'm on a walking trail committee in Kiltili and people would say to me why are you why are you putting in so much work into that walking trail and my answer to that is if one family in the area could choose a healthier lifestyle and bring their bring their kids onto that you know that um that rather than sitting in front of a screen to get uh, contentment and to get fulfillment you know, that they get it from to walk for half an hour up onto moorland or call it what you like um and just to sit and you will see birds and you will see shapes going over in clouds that the big fat man in smoke and, and oh his head's after blown off and there's all you know, the, um, all sorts of stuff that, that can happen um, so that to me is the biggest asset and also I dearly love people um, you know stone carving is a solitary experience um, you don't want anyone else um 
yakking away to you. You don't want to be yakking yourself. You just, um, quite often, um, you would spend a number of days working on a, a, a project and the in, what you would have done would be minuscule. You know, and it would, there's pieces of work out in the yard that, that would have taken months. And um, you know, I'm glad that I have other things that I can do because the age I am now, um, my shoulder, shoulders, uh, you think the striking hand is the one that does all the work, but the one receiving, holding the, the punch um, receives the shock. And you can put all sorts of rubber devices and this, that and the other. The, it'll transmit itself. Um, if I do a half day, if I if I carve to lunchtime, uh, I don't carve in the afternoon. It's um, you have to bring yourself down to that pace. But um, yeah, the, the interaction with people um, that is, uh, and it's fallen away. The congregation is in trouble. Sports clubs are in trouble. Um, like the the community development group that I'm a member of now. I, I have said to loads and loads of people who have turned their back on congregation, you know, like, um, would you not um, attend? And maybe for your children, there will be a place where they can go or, and um, you're sort of looked as if you have two heads, you know, um, and I feel for that, you know. I, now, the, there's a couple of local communities and yeah, there's just lovely stuff going on. But um, yeah, no, people are definitely the one of the greatest assets that after the hill. And, and just to come back to your own work um, with stones, uh, is there a particular type of stone that you work with or that's native to the area or? Well, granite is, is freely available, but the curiosity um, brings me strange places I happen on. There's a, a local, it's a volcanic stone around here. There's quartz, which is, just stay away from the damn thing, but yet Nile has, has to have a go. Um, there's a stone around here known as bell metal. The late Dick would have called it green stone. It's a little bit, uh, when you polish it up, it is green. But um, the local lads would have called it bell metal because when you when you try and work it, when you strike it, it makes a sound like a bell. But um, it's really, really hard on the tools and really, really <laughs> hard on the man. I uh, I think I have I've done my discovery in that that I don't have to go back. To, no, I the local granites. Um, you know, I, I'm quite happy to leave the, the outer shape on a boulder and just do what I have to do with the, the inner. Um, I, I'm happy, you know, the least influence in some of the work. Um, I have um, been drawn to, to water basins. God, they're everywhere. There's hundreds of the damn things, but I'm drawn to that in that, um, a stone to hold water. Um, the a, a dog will will drink out of a a stone basin or bath. Call it what you like. Uh, people talk about bird baths. My late father in law used to say, "You're making a fortune out of them baptismal fonts." <laughs> and um, I don't think I have a baptismal font. There was a church who who did discuss about. Um, using one of my stones as a as a holy water font but um, I think it wasn't shiny enough for some of the parish council but however that's <laughs> that's their loss but um, in Zen thinking you know I was looking enough to do a couple of Japanese style gardens and in Zen thinking to dip your fingertips just barely into water sitting in a basin and make a conscious, and you to say it, and make a conscious decision to cleanse your thoughts. And after a couple of seconds, to dip your fingertips again. You can dip your tongue as well. Um, and to go, I cleanse my environment. And um, 
know, just as a mantra, you know, rather than, you know, things are bad, there's a lot of stuff going on, and that, that you can actually remove yourself from it, rather than um, staying involved in the conflict and going back for another bait. Um, would there be any of your work that's inspired by the local landscape or by any local kind of sites? Yeah, the, um, there's loads of those. The, um, the mushrooms, there will be 48 mushrooms, um, which would have been purely from stack stands. Um, it's hard to believe it now that um, when you have a, a bloody combine with could have to go to 30 feet in width. Do you know, like, in my experience, it was a binder cut five feet. You know, um, and the binder um, just uh, put the corn into sheaves and you needed manpower. Like, you know, there was no point in sowing 50 acres of corn if you did not have the manpower um, to manhandle these sheaves. They had to be stuck um, and allowed, it would have been cut before it was uh, really ripe. Uh, because if you started handling corn that was really ripe, the mechanism would, would trash the grain out on the ground. So you cut it before it was ripe enough that it would trash freely. And then you let it season or dry out in, um, let the green go out of the straw in stooks. And then you stacked it a, uh, a stuck generally had about six, was it seven sheaves? You put three face and three, and then you put one. If there was a fall of ground, you put one to counteract the fall of ground. And then the, a stuck was you gathered the sheaves into it would weatherproof it, but it still wasn't fit to to bring to the haggard yet. And then it was loaded out of the stacks and brought into um to the haggard but there again um manpower you know traditionally you would hire a uh, trash engine and machines to come in to do it but everyone else wanted the trash and engine the same day so if you could um build a stand with stone that could keep the rat the rat and the mice out of your um, stack in the haggard. So I, I remember in Porters and Springfield, there was a line of them. Uh, I'd say there would have been room for about eight stacks along on these mushroom. Now the mushroom, everyone can imagine what a mushroom shapes. So if the rat tried to climb up the stem, which he could, and he tried to climb out the, um, the wider um, cap of the mushroom he fell off but um, I, I think they didn't know how high rats can jump but um, <laughs> it was only it was the best that they could it was the best that they could so that um, there will be um, I do not want to be known as your man below in Kalan that carves the mushrooms now um, a lot of trade you know years and years ago you could not serve your time to be a carpenter unless you came from a family of carpenters and um, I did get it into the chops from a family of stonies you know why should you be going at stone like we can't all go farming Do you know that um, well, I believe there's room for everyone um, but I, I definitely don't want to be known as your man that did this, your man that did that. Or I, um, but the one thing that... Um, God, I am sounding like an old man, aren't I? I, I I'm so grateful to know that I got to spend some of my time that it didn't really matter. You know, that I could just do what... Like people say, you can't read James Joyce's Ulysses because it's just he regurgitated pure whatever, but it was his. 
you know, and I have inflicted all sorts of shapes on our community and our society, some which will never be <laughs> seen by the public. <laughs> and, but then I do have uh, pieces in public spaces and, um, you know, I really enjoyed the, I, I was placing a piece of, of work which basically was one stone with another stone at an angle on top of it. No carving whatsoever. But to me, this represented the head of a dog. And um, this guy in his aristic ar tones was able to shout at me when he parked his car. Um, I hate work like that. It's accidental. It means nothing. I hate it. And my response to him was, but you noticed it. <laughs> And has you thinking, I'm sorry that it brought up that negative thought in you, but I would hate for my work to be uh, invisible and insignificant and people just to drive past it. And do you have a favourite piece yourself? You're um, going for a pound of flesh two close at the moment. There's... There's um, there's Dick. Dick Giant um, died with cancer. Um, I visited him in hospital. He um, he had been told that um, there was nothing more they could do for me. He couldn't eat. His throat was closed. And I didn't want Dick to die. And I said, it's not so bad, Dick. You know, it's not so bad. And I was gutted then, eventually, you know, like, obviously, if you don't eat, you don't live very long. And um, his daughters um, were clean out, clearing out his yard, and they gave me um, a piece of stone that, that he had untouched in his studio. And, um, yeah, I... I wanted to carve something to, to remember Dick but um, I went to Dick and um, he would give me 20 minutes of his time he would lend me some tools he would show me principles of um, of form and of shape and of balance and of this and of that and of the other and um, he wouldn't charge me for his time now that works both ways I can't say that um, I was taught by Dick because there was no contract but um, I prefer it this way I prefer that he was my mentor you know um, he's another John Fitzhenry in my life but um, the piece of stone um, it stands about oh five foot tall it is of um, my interpretation of one head on top of the other and that if you don't know what you're doing you know ask ask somebody you know an opinion and you don't you just you can hear their opinion but um the title being the two heads are better than one you know and um dick also charged me you know that if people come to you and they want to know about stone carving um show them the the principles and give them 20 minutes of your time free that you got it for nothing, now give it away. Um, and bloody hell, you got closer than I wanted you to get, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, happy to. Oh, I, I really enjoy sharing it, you know, because um, it matters to me. You know, it really matters to me. But, yeah. um, and it sounds yeah. like a wonderful piece as well. It sounds like a really, really interesting piece. Mm, sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Only for your bloody German car wouldn't go down the lane, you would have seen it. <laughs> Maybe I'll see a photograph. Maybe. As you see, as you want. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, story and, and, you know, so layered with, with meaning and, and significance as well for you. So, so, so thank you again. Um, I might just branch out into something a little bit different uh, and talk about 
you know, tourism within this area. Um, what particular sites do you think are the most popular for tourists who come in, and why might that be? Uh, I, I, I'm not big into the, I'm not big into the history. I'm not big into the, um, the, the people who talk about those Iron Age sites. There's the, this. There's that. There's the other. There's. Um, I um I have my own um dread of of you know what happened with rebellion and you know people leading um you know ill trained ill equipped people against professional troops. Uh, I've all I I I don't put down my nose in any way that's going that way, but I God I I, I think um The greatest asset that this place has is that hill. I um. I, I would love to, to slow people right down. I know the chances of talking children to put their bare foot into a cow pat has probably probably gone by. Um, is it not part of this interview that we have to go and find the cow pat? It's like the, there's no point in talking about this unless you've had the experience, me good man. If I said I've done it before, would you believe me? <laughs> no, I am. Um, I have a notion of of wanting to go up onto that mountain and give people a chance to cut a stone step, and that that stone step um, would stay on that hill, and that they don't. Um, it doesn't cost them money. You know, that it, it's just this is, this is the, your experience that you can come and that you can spend your time. Um, now it would involve um, somebody having the fun that big. I, I'm going to stick with what Dick taught me that, that um, you got it for nothing. Now give it away. Um, because the whole thing is based on you know, how big is the stack? Uh, I, I would love to re to give back what what I have have got from um, there, and, and it's from the people that I knew. It's um, there, my love of, of of being at peace in my own head. Um, of um, there, you can have all sorts of shrines to letting stuff go, and you can have all sorts of. I have an area um, where I go for solitude and and, um, and this, that and the other, but unless your head is in a good place when you go to these things, it, it doesn't. So to me, if um, to try and, and sell the, the idea of to, to, to get up into completely no monetary gain none you know like it's just I'm only back from Lanzarote I can't quote the sculptor out there but he like I, I have a book on his statements and, and one of his favourite words was stop stop you know um there's no groundwater in Lanzarote and we're building a high rise. They one high rise multi-story hotel out there. There was no point in bringing more people onto the island where they, they, ha there's, they have to desalinize the water for people to drink. Hugely expensive on our environment. So the houses are two story. That's, that's the limit. Um, and they're all to be painted white. Now, being out there, there must have been an odd kind of a bit rusty because you, you can see shades of brown here and there, but however, but um, oh, I, any development that I see, any um, touristy thing, it's hundreds of yurts. Um, I, I would love to, if something was set up that I could get a hold of um, two or three people at a time and just get them to slow down 
like I said to you, the, the chances of getting them to put their foot in a cow shit is scarce. But to pull um, a vegetable out of the side, to, um, to dress a chicken or to cut a fish or to just, uh, and to, to do something as silly as to, um, to go up there amongst the horse thighs and the ticks and everything else and carve a stone step. Um, and walk away from it without putting your name on it um, without um, it's not to to I didn't bring you here to, to show you this is what Niall Deacon can do with a few stones or this is um, I brought you here to to talk about the principles of stone carving and to to for God's sake leave yourself open to interpretation and, and not to be trying to impress other people with what you're doing very interesting um, just maybe in terms of broader reflection then what's the best thing about living in Kalan my space <laughs> my space my space <laughs> oh my space my space yeah my space the um, the local buildings um, they're all linked to to link to other people, they're linked to um, this, that, and the other. But oh, if we could hold on to my space, you know, it, um, just the simple little things a key from John Fitzhenry, a kiss for Nan. Um, you know, I ah, for. If we could get away from the, the let's stack it up and this is mine, you know. Why can't it be ours? You know, like why can't it be um I live here, it matters, you know, I I God I am an old man <laughs> Well, here's uh your opportunity to address that. If you could change one thing in the area, what would it be? Yeah that the card schools would have stayed on, that um, that people could laugh at themselves. You know, rather than oh there was there was there was whist drives in the local hall. Um, and the Christmas one would be you know, lucrative enough as in there would have been a ham, a few turkeys. Um and the um, an odd card shark used to come to that really good card guys but quite often now there were people who who did know how to play their cards but um, they could also laugh at um, you know holding on to the ace too long and then somebody not having a a, a card of that tr or of that suit and, and it being trumped and that they would roar laughing at the fact that you know what, what was it a winning card suddenly because they didn't play it right was and they would laugh heartily at themselves but there were other people who couldn't you know um, but if you interact with people you would see that and you would be able to address your own inability to laugh at, at your mistakes or cry at them um, yeah that's um, I miss that but um and um, what challenges do you think that this area of Calam will face in the kind of short and long term maybe future? The um, yeah, you know, the challenge is is about getting people to meet up, getting people to um, to just have converse to, <laughs> and like if if you're not a member of um, of a congregation. The, 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 the community is still there you, you must and, and it's strange uh, it's the people who are members of a congregation that turn up at the, the stuff for community and the people who aren't don't uh, the, I, I don't know how to de-screen people I don't know how um, but um, yeah and, and to live the experience rather than the recording it like why 
to who will see the video of, of um, this, that and other, like who will process it? Derek, we've stuff that will never, uh, camcorder stuff that will never be looked at. It'll never be looked at. So, um, yeah. Um, so I suppose the last question for me then, um, for you, from, from me, <laughs> is what does it mean to be from Kilat? Yeah. Um, oh, for me, it's it's um, try and keep that simple, you know, rural life values. Um, um, to leave it better than I got it, you know. It, um, I um, I don't look on this as mine. I I look on. It, I had the use of it, you know, for my time. Um, I'm aware that it wasn't put together by me. It was put together by countless generations. Um, my responsibility is to pass it on, um, a little bit better, if I could. It'd be hard to beat John and Dick um, and other people who um, who created an impression on me. Um, you know, there were there were um, just one lass I know, um, and I distinctly remember her in a heartfelt plea. You know, God, you know, um, grant me that I live long enough that I rear my children. You know that, um, and once I've that done, whatever else is a bonus. You know, I get to, that that just um, I'm resp- I'm these are my children. I'm responsible for them. I want the best for them. I don't want somebody who doesn't necessarily want the best for them having a huge influence. And there's just simple little things like that. Um, yeah, it, it's about um, to to lose the word mine and to incorporate the word our um, and to look on it not as possessive but as responsibility um, yeah that's it I can't say no more I'm running out of spit <laughs> well the last thing I'll, I'll say to you is, is the, there se- the last very very last well, is, is there anything you would like to add to the record that you haven't talked about or didn't get the opportunity to talk about Oh no, I think I've hit it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Mark. It was really, really insightful and fascinating and really enjoyable. And so I'll just stop the recording now. Great.